Hello, listeners. This is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2023. This week's lesson, number seven, is titled Mission to My Neighbour, ready for teaching on November 18 from the series God's Mission, Our Mission. And your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 11. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that your word is there for us to open. And this week, as we read it, as we read it together, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us. We're learning about the effect the Holy Spirit had on the early church in the book of Acts. And Lord, we thank you that your Spirit allowed the work of spreading the gospel to increase so rapidly. But also the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of individuals changed them as well. And I pray that this week, as we open your word, that your word will become so meaningful to us that your Holy Spirit will show us the things that we need to learn and that we may be blessed and that the people that we react with all through the week may be blessed as well and for individuals that we pray for too. And today I'd like to pray for Tino Mars, who's from Tanzania, and Carol and Samé and her son Anthony, and who's lost a husband uh, recently. And I pray, Lord, that you'll be with the, the daughter Anne as well. Lord, Anthony Stewart needs our prayers. He's on Union Island and Heather Hart in Jamaica and Moses in Uganda and Diana in S- Diana Santiago and Gina Mendoza and her family. Lord, there are just so many more who need prayer. And I pray that each of us who are listening will mention these people in our prayers, but also pray to God for those about us that they may turn towards the love of Jesus and want to follow him. Bless us now as we open your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text is Luke chapter 10 and verse 27. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. Let's read that again, Luke ten twenty seven. He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We all know this text, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Yet, Our love for God can become superficial if we say that we love God but do not obey Him. We think that we love God, but how is this love demonstrated in our day-to-day life? Loving God requires full commitment of our heart, soul, body and mind daily. Anyone can say that he or she loves God. Doing it, however, requires conscious effort. However, even though loving God is good and important, God also wants us to love others, because our love for others reflects our love for God, and it does so in a powerful and very real way. 1 John 4.20 states, If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Paul also says in Galatians 5.14 that all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. This week, we will be learning how this lesson can be applied in our lives. Sunday, November 12. The Question of Questions Who are we? Why are we here? What happens when we die? What is our ultimate fate? These are, in many ways, the most important questions mortal beings, beings who know they are mortal, can ask. Oysters and chickens are too, but they don't know it. And in the Gospel of Luke... Someone comes to Jesus with what is, in fact, the most crucial question of all. 
Read Luke chapter 10, verse 25. What did this lawyer ask and why did he ask it? Luke 10 and verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? However serious the question itself, the Bible clearly states that he came to test Jesus. We know that sometimes some people may come with scepticism, even unbelief, and may not even be serious in their questioning, but they could still be reached. This is precisely how Jesus dealt with the lawyer, even though he knew that the man's initial intentions were not genuine. Yet, for the lawyer... And the audience, this question was an opening that Jesus could use to prompt them to search their own hearts. Even knowing the lawyer's motives, Jesus was not going to ignore him or be disrespectful to him. In the end, what question could be more important than this one? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? No matter what our religious rituals or practices, behind them all is this crucial question. In contrast to this one, what else really matters for beings whose lives are depicted as a vapour that appears for a little time and then vanishes away, as James writes in James 4 verse 14? For what is the only other option to eternal life than eternal death? Read 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30 to 32. What point is Paul making here that underscores the importance of eternal life? 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 30. And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If, in the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. However dubious his motives, the lawyer asked a crucial question, and Jesus, ever watchful to use any and every opportunity for mission, took advantage of it to reach souls. And so to finish the day. How can we also be mindful to take advantage of whatever opportunities come our way to witness, even if the circumstances are not ideal? Monday, November 13. Jesus' Method and Response The Bible tells us that the lawyer came to test Jesus, but Jesus knew what his intentions were. Indeed, God knows the longings and desires of our hearts more than we ourselves do. And we certainly do not know the heart or the motives of those who question us, do we? Sometimes people from other religions question us about our faith. For instance, our Muslim friends ask us questions related to Jesus' divinity, such as, where in the Bible did Jesus say that he is God? Or, why do you say there is one God when you have three persons in the Trinity? Though these seem to be provocative questions, yet the heartfelt need for Jesus can be genuine and can represent a deep longing or emptiness of those asking the questions. We don't know their hearts. We don't need to. We simply need to minister to others the best we can, regardless of their deepest motives. Read Matthew 25, 56, Acts 17, 11, 1 Corinthians 15, 3, and 2 Timothy 3, 16. How do these verses help us understand Jesus' response to the lawyer in Luke 10, verse 26? Let's read that verse first. He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And then back in Matthew 26, verse 56, But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him 
and fled. And Acts chapter 17, verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. And 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Sometimes we want answers, but do not put in the work ourselves to find them. Jesus said, What is written in the law? How do you read it? In Luke 10, 26, Jesus pointed to a very important aspect of learning. Instead of only listening to what others have to tell us, we need to read the Scriptures, the Word of God, for ourselves. The answers always are there, and the Holy Spirit works on our hearts to impress upon us what we need to do. God has given us his word. In it, we can find all the truth that we need to know about how we are supposed to live, about how we are supposed to treat others, and about how we can inherit eternal life. Sure, there is a role for teachers and ministers, but in the end, we must go to the Bible for the truths that matter. As it says in Psalm 119, verse 101, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. This verse is not just poetry. It's sacred truth, pointing us to the word of God and its importance to the believer. And so to finish today, Jesus, the word of God made flesh, always pointed people back to the written word. What should this tell us about the importance of the Bible and why we must reject any philosophical or theological reasoning that lessens our trust in the Bible? Tuesday, November 14, to inherit eternal life. Read Luke chapter 10, verses 27 and 28. What was the lawyer's answer to his own question? Luke 10, beginning at verse 27. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. The lawyer had asked the question, and he himself gave the answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbour as yourself, in verse 27. What was the response of Jesus? He said, you have answered rightly, in verse 28. Jesus went on to challenge him to do something about it by saying, do this and you will live, in verse 28. For most believers, giving the right answers about doctrine and faith is not that difficult. The challenge instead comes in doing what they know is right and following what they believe. A lot of people who, though knowing enough to be saved, will be lost because they didn't obey what they knew. That's how serious this issue is. Just knowing about loving God and your neighbour isn't enough. You have to do it. Read James 2, verses 17 to 22. How do these verses parallel what Jesus said to the lawyer? So James chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? If we love God, we will read his word, we will pray, we will keep his commandments, and we will be obedient to his voice with all our heart. 
If I say I love others, but I don't care about others in church, or if I ignore the needs of others when I can help, what good is my faith? Christianity is not just a set of distinct beliefs. It is a way of life. And we read in James 2, verses 15 and 16, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? And so to finish today, how much do you care about the welfare of others? How much do you follow the words of Paul in Philippians 2 verse 4? Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. By God's grace, how can you learn to care more for others? Wednesday, November 15. Loving others as we love ourselves. Read Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. How does what Jesus himself said here compare to his answer to the lawyer in Luke 10, 27 and 28? Matthew 22, beginning at verse 37. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And then we compare it with Luke 10, 27 and 28. So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. According to Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40, Jesus made it clear that the everyday expression of true belief hangs upon these two commandments. And Luke 10, 27 and 28 makes it clear that if a person does these two things, then he or she will have eternal life. Ellen White writes in Christ Object Lessons, page 49, Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian's character. This alone can make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. End of quote. Read Galatians 5.14, Micah 6, 6 6-8, and 1 John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. How did these verses reinforce what Jesus had told us? First of all, Galatians chapter 5, verse 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And Micah 6 verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And First John 4, verses 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. According to Paul, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbour as yourself, Galatians 5.14. For Paul, loving God can be practically seen only when that love is exemplified in how we treat others. Even though he stated that the righteous shall live by faith in Romans 1.17, yet living by faith is not something that is hidden, unknown or unseen by others. Paul, Micah and John make it clear that practical works demonstrate the reality of the faith that we claim. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul stated very forcefully that if one claims to have great knowledge or to do great deeds or to have the great faith or even to give one's life but does not have love, then that person has become like sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So to finish the day, look at the LNG White quote above, which I'll reread again. It says, Love is the underlying principle of God's government in heaven and earth, and it must be the foundation of the Christian's character. This alone can make and keep him steadfast. This alone can enable him to withstand trial and temptation. Notice what she says about how only in love can people remain steadfast and endure temptation. How does this idea show that the command to love is not salvation by works, but instead an expression of the faith that we have in Jesus? Thursday, November 16, The Good Samaritan Story Today When commending the lawyer for giving the right answer, Jesus said, Do this and you will live, in Luke 10, 28. And thus he touched the very core in the man's heart. Giving all the right answers was easy for the lawyer, but doing those things was an issue 2,000 years ago, and it is still an issue for many of us today. The lawyer wanted to trap Jesus and show off his knowledge. He asked a follow-up question. Who is my neighbour? In Luke 10, 29. Read Luke 10, 30-37. How would you summarise Jesus' meaning in the story here? Luke 10, beginning at verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come back I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Are there people around us who have been unjustly treated by others? Have we done whatever we can to help them? It is true that sometimes pastors, elders and members do not help those who need help. Sometimes people of another faith may be kinder toward people in the community than we are. We may talk about being kind, yet others may meet the needs of the people that we don't address. If our faith means anything, we must reach out and help those in need. Jesus concluded the story of the Good Samaritan by asking who among the three was truly a neighbour to the person who needed help. Thus the question, Ellen White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 503, Who is my neighbour? is forever answered. Christ has shown that our neighbour does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, colour or class distinction. Our neighbour is every person who needs our help. Our neighbour is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbour is everyone who is the property of God. End of quote. And that brings us to our challenge for today. Begin praying daily for someone who is different from you, or even for someone you may not personally like. And challenge up, 
list at least three names of your acquaintances, that's non-Adventists, identify their needs, emotional, physical, social, etc., and consider how you can minister personally to those needs. What can you do practically for them in the coming week? Friday, November 17. There are many hungry, needy and mistreated people in our world today. You can do your part, however small it might seem to be. We are not going to solve all the world's problems before Jesus returns. We haven't been called to do that. But until then, our work can be as basic as helping someone you know who does not have enough food or it can be helping a member in the church who is facing injustice, even bigotry, which remains a real problem in our world, even today. And then there's this quote from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 25. Pure religion and undefiled before the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Good deeds are the fruit that Christ requires us to bear. Kind words, deeds of benevolence, of tender regard for the poor, the needy, the afflicted. When hearts sympathise with hearts burdened with discouragement and grief, when the hand dispenses to the needy, when the naked are clothed, the stranger made welcome to a seat in your parlour and a place in your heart, angels are coming very near, and an answering strain is responded to in heaven. Every act of justice, mercy and benevolence makes melody in heaven. The Father from his throne beholds those who do these acts of mercy and numbers them with his most precious treasures. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels. Every merciful act to the needy, the suffering, is regarded as though done to Jesus. When you succour the poor, sympathise with the afflicted and oppressed, and befriend the orphan, you bring yourselves into a closer relationship to Jesus. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, how can we make sure we understand that the command to love God and others is not salvation by works? When we consider who Jesus is and what he did for us on the cross— Why is the idea that anything we can do to earn or merit salvation so great an error? And we're referred here to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, about what Jesus actually did. Verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. How can we learn to distinguish between working for salvation, which is a fatal mistake, and revealing in our lives the salvation that we already have in Jesus? And question two, how can we learn to recognize some of the inherent prejudices we might have toward those who are different from us? And three, other than those passages studied in this week's lesson, what other scriptural support do you find for the need to show kindness to others, no matter who they are? Mission Path to Spain, Part 1, by Andrew McChesney Louis fell ill shortly after he was baptised and enrolled as a theology student at Venezuela Adventist University. At first he thought it was the flu, but the symptoms worsened and he struggled to breathe. Physicians suggested that he might be allergic to the pollen from the orange trees that blossomed around the university. He received many injections, but his lungs still wouldn't allow him to breathe. Physicians advised him to quit his studies and return home, but he didn't want to leave. He continued to get tested. Then a medical test showed that he was infected with HIV. It was a time when people were afraid of HIV in Venezuela. Many thought that they might catch the virus through touch. 
Louis was asked to leave the seminary. Louis had no choice but to go home. At home, he underwent additional medical checks. The results were always the same, HIV. Louis couldn't understand why. Hadn't he given his heart to God? Hadn't he been studying to become a pastor? He was very sad. A church elder noticed his downcast countenance. You should be joyful, the elder said. If you aren't joyful, it's because you haven't met Jesus. The observation struck deep in Louis' heart. He went to his bedroom and knelt down. He prayed to God for forgiveness. He acknowledged that he had not glorified God with his body in his former life and was at fault for contracting HIV. I don't want you to heal me, he prayed. I just want to preach for the rest of the days that you grant me. At that moment, something unusual happened. Louis felt as if his heart starting to burn and the heat spread over his whole body. He blacked out. When Louis got tested once again, the results came back negative. Surprised, he asked to be tested again and again. Always he was HIV free. Why are you asking for more tests if the results are negative? The physician asked. You don't need to be tested any more. Making good on his promise to God, Louis dedicated his life to preaching and bringing people to Jesus. He got married and completed his theology studies at the university in 2006. I haven't stopped preaching the gospel ever since, he said. Today, Louis and his family are missionaries in Spain. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offering that helps support missionaries around the world. Read next week about how a hostage crisis caused Louis to leave Venezuela. You have been listening to a reading of the Adult Sabbath School Lessons by Dr. Percy Harold and the inside story by his niece, Sibylla. Apart from being provided free to those who are visually impaired, these audio lessons are available on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministry app, on SoundCloud, Apple iTunes, and also on YouTube. Search for Percy Harold Sabbath to find all of these. And remembering all the time that God is always faithful.